Welcome to Compared to Who, the podcast to help you make peace with your body so you can savor God's rest and feel his love. If you're tired of fighting body image the world's way, Compared to Who is the show for you. You've likely heard lots of talk about loving your body, but my goal is different. Striving to fall in love with stretch marks and cellulite is a little silly to me. Instead, I want to encourage you and remind you with the truth of scripture that you are seen, you are known, and you are loved no matter what your size or shape. Here, the pressure is off. If you're looking for real talk, biblical encouragement, and regular reminders that God loves you and you're not alone, you've come to the right place. I hope you enjoy today's show and hey, tell a friend about it. Hey there, welcome to the Compared to Who show. I'm Heather Creekmore. I'm so glad you are here for another one of my intuitive eating coaching calls. Or maybe I should call it my airing all of my food issues publicly calls. I don't know, <laughs> but I'm here with my favorite coaches, Charlie Castle and Erin Todd from the Intuitive Eating for Christian Women podcast. I know a lot of you are listening to their show as well, and today they're going to help me. So welcome, ladies. We're glad to be Hello. here. It's been a while. We didn't do one of these in December and then... January, I had the month long series. So it's been a little while. It's good to be back with y'all. Absolutely. How are you doing? Yeah. So I would say I'm doing pretty well. Um, there's something I've been wrestling for a couple weeks now since, since Christmas. And, and really it goes along with, I think what most of us who have been in this world, for any length of time, wrestle like, what should I do in January to get healthier? And I've been doing this long enough that I, I think I know the right answer, but I am tempted by this concept of, should I be sugar-free? Mm. And, and I'll, I'll fill that out a little bit more. So I was triggered by an interview I did with, with another woman who's kind of in the same genre, but she talked about like her food addiction and how she's been better off just like saying no completely to sugar. And, you know, at first I kind of like wrestled with like, well, no, like I know, I know, I know, I know that restricting will make me want it more. Like I know that much about my body. And in fact, I'll tell you a win for me right now is like, there is a box of thin mints, Girl Scout cookies in my kitchen that has been there for six days now, right? Like a couple of years ago, I would have been, they, they would have all been gone or I would have been thinking about them constantly. And the only reason I know there was there is I got, I got some ice out of the freezer and I was like, oh, there's a box of thin mints still here. Huh. And I, but I didn't feel like I need to have one. I wasn't like thinking about them. And so I very much believe the truth that you all have spoken and, and that some of the other non-diet dietitians have spoken into me through this show of if, if I can be comfortable with the food, if you will, if I stop my restriction mindset, I will stop the binging. Mm -hmm. And that's happened for the most part across the board always, but mm -hmm you know, with the Girl Scout cookies are <laughs> the best example I can come up with. Cause that's, that's something that's taunted me for decades. Y'all. I mean, you know, you might you January resolution and then dang, those little Girl Scouts, they <laughs> come right in like three months, three weeks later with their, their boxes of deliciousness. And so, um, so that's a win, but as I, you know, we, we can all, I guess, talk ourselves into things. Right. And so as I talk myself through this sugar concept and, you know, we're getting close to Lent, right. And, oh, I've got a history of giving up sugar for Lent. That was my thing. And I can talk myself into the, well, sugar's not good for you anyway. Isn't that what gentle nutrition is? Isn't gentle nutrition knowing what's good for my body and giving up things that aren't good for my body? And then, I mean, just to add another layer to this, I look at the pictures of myself from Christmas when my sugar consumption was higher. And I'm like, ooh, that person does not look healthy. That's the sugar. 
if I give up the sugar, then I'll look healthier. And, you know, all of those, it, it, you know, it's, it's the same argument or excuse me, the same song, different verse, right? Same argument, <laughs> different, different uh, claim, but what's, I don't know what, help me. <laughs> Where do I go with all these feelings? We have a lot to unpack. Oh, good. <laughs> good, good, good. I was writing my notes and my questions like as fast as I could. Okay. <laughs> oh, I have so many questions. So mm-hmm. let me, okay, let, let me preface this. Okay. We're I have really come to be able to describe what we are trying to achieve in working together, like what I am trying to achieve in working with clients. And it is helping you get to a place of making authentic health decisions. Okay. And those authentic health decisions feel purposeful. They feel personal. And they feel peaceful. Okay. And I, I believe that the sweet spot of where you can make health decisions that feel purposeful, peaceful, personal. personal. Thank you. (laughs) Yes. They come from a place where what you know about science, Mm -hmm. what you know about scripture, God's word, and your lived experience where those three things overlap is your sweet spot where you will be able to make these decisions peacefully, purposefully, personally, right? So that's what I, those are the three areas here that I want to draw your attention to um, in just some of the things you were saying and some of my questions, that's what we're kind of getting at. So your lived experience with restricting sugar. Mm -hmm. What does that tell you? Well, okay. So the eating disorder wants to talk first Okay. (laughs) and the eating disorder says my lived experience with restricting sugar is I really like the way I look. Okay. I look different when I don't eat sugar. I'm not inflamed. Right. And then, and then that kind of crosses the line to wellness, right? Like, Ooh, inflammation bad. So don't I have a moral obligation to keep my body healthier by restricting that inflammation from happening? Like, isn't that a wise decision? So eating disorder would say that. Okay. But then, like I mentioned with the Girl Scout cookies, I know I'll obsess. I I really do. Like I, I I can convince myself that I won't. Okay. Where I almost believe myself, like I I'm over it now. And I think part of that might be progress I've made with intuitive eating. Right. I feel like I'm not as, um, I don't like the word addicted, but I feel like I'm not as needy about it right now. And so I feel like I probably could do without it. I mean, I forgot that those Girl Scout cookies were in the freezer. Like maybe I could just be sugar-free now and it wouldn't be a big deal. But my lived experience <laughs> would be otherwise. But but then again, Shar, I would say, but I had an eating disorder then. Like I've come so far. Can I handle it now? Okay. Okay. So your eating disorder self, that part of you sounds pretty focused on your physical health. That seems to be really important to that part of you. And I hear that part of you talking about inflammation and that that might not be good for your physical health, your overall health. You you stated that you feel like you look inflamed when you're eating sugar. Is your physical health a look? (laughs) You know, I love that you asked that question because I've actually been wrestling that. Like, can you tell whether or not a person is healthy? And, and that that's programming. Like, I really don't know how to deprogram that because I feel like you can, but then I look at the picture of myself on my honeymoon when I think someone would look at that picture and be like, that's a healthy woman right there. <laughs> like, no, I was not a healthy woman. That was a very unhealthy woman who had only eaten salmon and grapefruit for like eight weeks. <laughs> and, you know, it's like, so, so yes, 
or, or no. I mean, you can't. Health is not a look. You're right. So, so let me bring you back to like recent memory, right? When you're mm-hmm. when you're looking back on Christmas time and you were eating more sweets because the season calls for it and we enjoy that. In the moment, how did you feel? Well, oh, <laughs> let me add another layer to this. Okay. We had a really difficult season. Okay. Um, had some personal challenges Mm -hmm. that we were dealing with, um, relational challenges that put a ton of stress on both my husband and I, Mm -hmm. and, you know, we were working through it together and I felt secure and safe with our family, but I had this outside stressor that I was Mm -hmm. thinking about pretty much all through November and all through December. Right. And so, and so as I processed star, I mean, you know me, I'm always thinking through things. It's like, well, I want to say I looked quote unquote puffy or bad because of the sugar, but maybe it was the stress, but oh no, no, I'm going to blame the sugar. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So the eating disorder has you really, really focused on physical health. And, and that might even be a guise because we're kind of getting to, maybe this isn't about physical health. Maybe this is about a look. Mm -hmm. So tell me about your lived experience with restricting sugar and your mental health. I mean, aside from just throwing an eating disorder label on it, I'm not really sure how to describe it other than I wanted it. Like I was thinking about all the time, right? Like there's a low level or maybe even a high level obsession, right? Had to have it. And then the, the bargaining that happens, right? The, okay, just a little bit. Oh no, I can't, I can't cheat today. I can't cheat today. You know, that whole good, bad, but then there's like the guilt and the shame and the, the negotiation that, you know, the, the devil on one side and the angel on the other, like, don't do it, Heather. No, you can just have one and then you won't have any more. And then, you know, (laughs) and and so, you know, all of those kind of things were consuming for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And so when you're talking about your mental health, I'm also hearing some stuff about like emotional health. You've mentioned guilt, you mentioned shame, um, probably feeling some feelings that didn't feel very healthy to you didn't feel very enjoyable to you. Yeah. I like to succeed. And I think that's why I was good at having an eating disorder, (laughs) right? Because there's a clear way to succeed. If you are quote unquote, good, if you follow the rules, you are good. And that is success. And so anything less than success feels like failure. Yeah. So we've explored a little bit of your lived experience with restricting sugar and I'll put you on the spot a little bit here. What has God told you about restricting sugar? What do you know from scripture? What do you know? What can speak into that? Yeah. Yeah. I truly believe that all things are permissible. I do. I truly believe that. I believe that he led the Israelites to the land of milk and honey because he wants us to experience sweet things. So I don't believe that sugar is evil, bad, the opposite of how God pictures health. I don't think God's mad at us for eating sweet things, like not none of those things. But I'll tell you I, where I can argue with myself is I have a strong family history of diabetes. Okay. Right. Yeah. And and so, and I had gestational diabetes with my, um, with my third, I skirted by with my fourth, but I was right on the line and I begged her not to label me that. <laughs> so I wouldn't have to send her my food charts every week, but, um, yeah. So, I mean, I, I feel, especially the older I get, I do, I'm feeling that pressure of, oh, my mom got diabetes, like, you know, about four years older than I am right now when she was diagnosed, like Heather, you know, wake up. (laughs) Uh, Are you being 
irresponsible or are, you know, are you damaging your health by making it a free for all? Yeah. So now we're kind of getting into the science piece of things. And so it's sounding like there could be some clarification for you around diabetes and causes of diabetes and things that affect diabetes. Um, I'm hearing that you understand that there's a genetic piece of diabetes. That's for sure. That's probably the highest determinant of getting diabetes. And then there's all these lifestyle factors like your stress level, how much you sleep, um, exercise and movement. Yes, your food. Um, But really the sugar that you eat is a pretty small percentage of what determines whether you get diabetes or not. Mm. That's what my knowledge Mm -hmm. of diabetes is. So I can kind of, I can be that, that voice for you, right. As a, a dietitian, right. That you're, you're working with. I can, I can say that to you that my research has led me to believe that eating a ton of sugar is actually like a small, and you're not even eating a ton of sugar, Mm -hmm. right? Eating a normal amount of sugar is an extremely, like, I wouldn't even call that a risk factor for diabetes. So, but that would be an area I think for you to learn more about, to help you make your Mm -hmm. personal, peaceful, purposeful, authentic health decision. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, one specific thing, and I'm going to throw this out there for whatever it's worth, but one specific thing I've been kind of thinking through is there is a iced tea place like right next to my homeschool community. I don't know if they have them all over the country now or not. It's kind of like the new Starbucks, but here in Texas, we have iced tea and you can go in, you get any kind of, there's like 60 different kinds of iced tea. Um, and so that's like, and you know, and of course like the smallest glass is like a 32 ounce glass. Right. But so that's like a treat that I enjoyed like almost every week <laughs> last fall, every homeschool community day, I'm going over to HTO and I'm getting me a sweet tea and that's going to help me through the afternoon. And, but my mom, right before she got diabetes, they had read some research. They were all, they were big, my family, big diet soda drinkers, read some research about like the chemicals being bad. And so they switched to regular soda. And Mm -hmm. so my mom was drinking regular soda for the first time in her life for like four or five months. And then boom, the diabetes came. Now I understand it's bigger than that, Mm -hmm. but, um, but psychologically that's like, it's an obstacle for me. I'm like, uh Oh, I'm drinking the sugar drink. Uh, Is the same thing going to happen that happened to mom? You know, (laughs) like, like, am I just repeating the pattern? Yeah. So, so I'm hearing like some mental restriction, Mm. right? Like you, you've been on this journey for a while or working through allowing sugar and all of those things, but there, there is still something kind of playing in your head of like sugar is bad. Mm. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm still thinking sugar is bad or there's a level of sugar that's been okay, but past that is not okay. Yeah. And this conversation, I can really see why this conversation with your guest was triggering for you, um, on a couple of different layers. And so you have to look at, is this all or nothing approach beneficial to me? Mm. Does that work for me? Do I, do I see that working for me? Does does the idea of going sugar free and never eating sugar again line up for me? Does it fit in that overlap of what I know about science? And we didn't even talk about the science of restriction. Mm-hmm. Does it line up for me and what I know about science, what my lived experience is, and what I believe God says? Yeah. Yeah. 
I mean, it really, it, it goes back to the believing in unicorns thing that I like to talk about. Right. Like, I still kind of want to believe the unicorn. Like I want to believe that I could do it now and then it would be sugar free. And then all the extra weight from intuitive eating and and aging would just melt off. And I would magically transform into this healthy, perfect version of myself, which, you know, I think that's what we all wrestle, right? That's that, that's the lie of diet culture. That's the promise of diet culture. That's the idol. And, and I'm still tempted by it in this one area. And I want to write it off to health, but I, I, I know it's the idol <laughs> beckoning me. Right. I mean, yeah, your, your, your points are right on. I don't, I don't think it's against God's will. I think that if I try to restrict, I will go back to binging it, you know, and actually I had a lived experience on Friday, my husband and I haven't gone on a date night in forever because we have children and activities every single night of the week. And it's just been a long time. <laughs> and so Friday night, we're like, we're going out. And so we went to a nice restaurant, but sometimes I don't find anything I like to eat at nice restaurants because I don't eat fish. And I don't know, there just wasn't, there just weren't things that I ate. And so they had like a fancy burger and I just got the burger and I ate it with the bun. And after I ate most of that burger, I was stuffed. But my husband asked for the dessert menu because he hasn't been out to dinner with me in a long time. And he has been trained after 17 years of marriage to know that if Heather's going out to dinner, Heather's going to order dessert. And so he's like, which one do you want? And I'm like, I'm really full. And he's like, what's wrong? <laughs> like, I'm like, I think it's because I ate the hamburger with the bun on it. And also because I didn't like not eat all day waiting for us to go out to dinner, like all those things too. But it was a very strange experience to not need the sugar at the end of the meal to be satisfied. But I, I do believe if I went back to restricting sugar, I would probably be begging for dessert or at least thinking about, should we get dessert? Should we not get dessert? I don't know. I kind of want to get dessert, but no, I'm trying to be good. I'm not going to have dessert now. I said, I wasn't going to have sugar again, but maybe I should just have sugar this one time. And you know, all of those things that I rattle through. Yeah. So is that health? Hmm. Yeah. Not, no, no, I've got more important things to think about. Yeah, girl. Yeah, you do. Erin, chime in girl. So I just want to point out that I noticed two things underneath this. Okay. I'm going to go sugar free. It's like, well, why? Like, what do you really want there? And I heard that you really wanted to be in control and snuffing out your fear of diabetes, which you know, Heather, I hate, I hate to say it as bluntly as this, but like we can do everything right and still have a disease. Yeah. And that's not a moral failing of ours. It's not anything that we've done that's wrong. We're not being punished. Some people, most bodies experience some form of disease. It's normal. Yeah. Um, and you're not in control of it. And God is in control of it. So like, let him be in control. So I'm, I'm feeling like you need to put down the fear mm. of diabetes and then of course, always there's that fear control issue with how we look that's mm-hmm. always there. And like you already said, you, you know, you're wrestling that constantly. It's always a temptation. We live in a world that tempts us every day with this. So um, just calling the fear motivate motivators below that desire to go sugar free. And it's like, yeah. you don't ever want your basis for a big choice like that to be fear or yeah. response to fear. That's just not, um, good place to make decisions from. Yeah. But Love then, based decisions. But let's talk about the people that like, I think I could say I am quote unquote addicted to sugar, right? Like I know, like Amy doesn't like to use that language, Amy Carlson. And, and I, I kind of agree with her there, but then I just had a guest on that'll be on the show later this month who was very comfortable using that language. Um, like what, I don't know, what, what do we, what do we do with that? Like, I know there's a lot of gray area and a lot of grace in the gray, but how, how would I know if I was addicted to sugar? <laughs> right? Uh, this is the, this is kind of one of those like real passionate kind of things for me. Mm-hmm. Um, 
And this is where you'd have to look at the science and where does it line up? And, but I will say that it doesn't make sense to me that we could be addicted to something we have to have to live. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that's what Amy says too. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm in Amy's boat. Yeah. I can, I can send you loads and loads and loads of resources from that boat, but someone can also send you loads and loads of research from the other boat. Yeah. So you have to, you know, dig through it and and pray about it and and get to where where you take everything you know about your experience of sugar and et cetera mm-hmm. and what you know about science and and pull it together. I think that we could argue that we're all addicted to sugar because we all must have carbohydrates to function. Mm-hmm. Like that's what our bodies. Yeah live off of. And if you are restricting in any way, your body is designed to tell you to eat sugar. Hmm. That's like normal, the way you were created. Yeah. But what about distinguishing like the white sugar, processed sugar from honey? I don't know. I even honey's processed most of the time, (laughs) but like what, you know, and then I get, and then I get into the whole, like, but sugar is more addictive than cocaine. I mean, how many times have we heard that tossed around, but then my lived experience jar is that those girl scout cookies are still in the freezer Yeah, because I've not been restricting. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Your lived experience is that when you are deprived, you feel addicted to sugar. Yeah. But when it's allowed, you want it, sure, but you don't think about it all day and you don't feel completely drawn to it. And yeah. The when when <clears throat> when you get down to the chemistry of it, like glucose is glucose. And yes, it's pers- it's it's uh in different foods it's presented in different quantities it's presented with different macro and micronutrients and and fiber and you know, all these different things that do change how quickly we absorb it and digest it but it's still just all sugar it's all mm. glucose or sucrose or you know and like our bodies are designed to process it. Mm. So unless you are like really going crazy with sugar, like your body can pretty well adapt to that. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's yeah. such a big lie. Well, and I have to feel like knowing what I know about blood sugar regulation, I have to feel like I'm doing better for my body now by eating regularly and keeping my blood sugar stable instead of not eating and then eating all the Girl Scout cookies at one time (laughs) when my blood sugar is low and then taking it high with a spike and then not eating because I feel bad about eating all the Girl Scout cookies and waiting and waiting and waiting and then I don't know, eating all of whatever else is high in sugar because I'm starving and taking my blood sugar on like a really radical roller coaster ride instead of um, instead of just eating a little bit here and there yeah, or eating dessert really is even a better way to think about it because dessert is the sugar coming after protein and mm-hmm. <laughs> and other fats and other nutrients. So the spike I wouldn't think is as big coming then. So, yeah. You had something else, Erin. You said there were two things you really heard. What was the other thing? Oh, the other thing was just like how I think sugar-free is a very all or nothing thing. Like you immediately went to, I'm going to cut everything out. Why does it have to be everything? Mm. Why couldn't it just be? A little bit that changes on a wave you ride every day as you are determining what sounds good to eat, how you're feeling, what your energy levels are like, what you want to feel like after you eat. Like, why do we need to make these absolute rules, policies about food that we then cling to regardless of circumstance? I I don't, I, I mean, I 
have an overworked brain and I have decision fatigue. So I do see the appeal of a rule. <laughs> Don't get me mm-hmm. wrong. I'm a rule follower. I get it. It seems easier, but then you're living in this tension of constantly fighting with the rule and it's not yeah. actually easier mm. for your brain or your body or anything. It's harder. Yeah. You have to wrestle that constantly. Like you're saying, you're bargaining, you're negotiating all the things that you're doing, the mental gymnastics all day. I think it's easier to make an on fly decision that you're listening to your body and your lived yeah. experience and you're tuning in to whatever your needs are for the moment and that seems like when I'm saying it now it's like it does sound harder <laughs> but it's actually easier well, it's the beauty of just that's like- gentle nutrition yeah that right there is gentle nutrition recognizing hey I've had a lot of you know sugary sweet things today and if I eat that cake I don't really know that it's going to feel great or that I'm going to have the energy that I want to have so I'm pass that up today, even though it did kind of sound good, I'm going to choose something that is a little bit more substantial and going to feel a little bit better in my body. That's gentle nutrition. Yeah. Yeah. Which can bring us full circle to, I think, I think what's maybe triggered me to want to go to all or nothing, but the actual like decision slash change I need to make is there's like nothing for me to grab in our pantry. Mm. And so I grab a handful of chocolate chips. And I think that that is where my tweak needs to happen. And I've had the thought, like, you just need to buy something like healthier that you could just grab that you would eat. But it's like, oh, grapes, you got to wash them. Oranges, you got to cut it. You know, it's like, you can't just put it like, go in, grab a handful, put it in your mouth and walk away. Mm -hmm. But that is, is probably the, the gentle nutrition tweak I need to make. I would probably be quote unquote healthier or taking more steps towards health, (laughs) greater health. If I was grabbing something that was more nourishing, I'm not that a handful of chocolate chips is bad, but grabbing something that was more nourishing some of those times. And also you might be walking more towards satisfaction because if you're grabbing the chocolate chips, just because it's the only thing that's quick and available and it's not even what you really want, then you're not feeling satisfied on all these different levels, right? Like you're not satisfied with the nutrition value. You're not satisfied with the taste, the texture. Like it wasn't even what you wanted. You just did it because it was easy. Yeah. No, absolutely. Yeah. So this, this is where like the gentle nutrition piece, there is benefit to menu planning. There's benefit to stocking your pantry. Well, there's benefit to like planning and thinking about and even some food prep, Mm -hmm. like just things to make, make things available for you when you need them. Yeah when you want them help do whatever you can to set yourself up to make the choices that, you know, you really want to make. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. That's good. And that's, yeah. I mean, that's a much better decision than an all or nothing decision, but you know, I think our conversation is timely because Lent is like a couple weeks away Mm -hmm. and I have a feeling that I'm not the only person that's thinking about giving up sugar for Lent. Um, or at all, um, or giving up food things like Mm -hmm. the, their, their trigger foods, if you will, or for Lent. And so we're all going to be part of this really cool, what are we calling it? A project? What are are we calling it? Uh, what do we, what did we name it? A collaboration. Collaboration. That's a good word for it. Um, around Lent, where we're going to be talking about losing the lies for Lent instead of losing food things for Lent. What, tell me what your thoughts are about that coming up and how you're feeling about that project we've got coming up. I'm really excited for this project, Heather. This has been a long time coming. I think this is uh, a door into looking at fasting and food differently for me. For the first time, the Lord took me through that and the season of Lent a couple of years ago. So I just think it's um, 
a really important thing um, for everybody to understand and explore for themselves. And like, you have to um, lose the lies. So I'm so happy we have titled it this way. We're really um, going to speak back against diet culture um, and how it's kind of gotten its hooks into the church, specifically with fasting and Lent. Char, what are you thinking? Yeah, I'm, I'm just so excited for like, I'm, I'm excited to be talking about and exploring like the purpose of Lent and Mm -hmm. like why we're doing that, what we're, you know, focusing on, why did they do it then? Why are we doing it now? Um, and I'm excited to challenge people to explore their heart posture You know, is your desire to give up sugar for Lent about getting closer to God and, or or is it about losing weight Mm -hmm. and you're just, you know, so, um, yeah, I think this is going to be pivotal for a lot of people. Yeah. Well, it's going to be included. It's going to be what seven weeks. I think we're doing, are we, are we doing full seven weeks? Yeah. Um, Cause I guess it's six weeks, but we're getting extra one in there. Something I'm not sure it's 30 or it's 40 days. So I guess that's almost seven weeks. Um, and we're going to do, there's seven of us collaborators. So some of the other collaborators I've had on the show, like Megan Hadley, um, who is an RD from, um, I think it's called simple nutrition and she does fork the food rules. And then, um, Nicole Masita, I think is joining us from body beloved. I did a show with her about the fear of fat. Um, so she's really great. And then a couple new folks that you haven't heard from that I think are going to be really great too. Um, but we're going to do, I think we're going to do three videos a week. Mm -hmm. Uh, so you're going to get content like Monday, Wednesday, Friday, every week through Lent. So it's going to be really amazing. I'm going to put the link to sign up in the show notes. Um, I don't have it now as we record. So sorry if you're listening only, you are going to have to go look at those show notes and get the link to sign up, but sign up soon. I think we start February 20th or 21st, something in that range. Um, And we're really hoping that they'll join us, aren't we? Yeah, we are. Absolutely. This is such a special time of year. And when you combine prayer and fasting done properly, like the Lord really moves. I already feel him working he's already gone before us for years on speaking into this food and body stuff but like y'all I just I feel it like it is it's it's electric right now so (laughs) something is happening this Lent and I can't wait to see what it is that's gonna be awesome and I hope that you will be part of it don't miss it well Erin and Shara thanks so much for uh, helping me process today uh guess I'll uh guess I'll be continuing my intuitive eating (laughs) and not not go back to my restrictive ways. So thanks. Thanks for talking me off the ledge today. (laughs) Um, and I hope something in today's episode has helped you, my listener friend as well. I hope it's helped you stop comparing and start living. Bye-bye. Oh, hey there, before you go, if something from today's show blessed you, may I ask a huge favor, leave a review on your favorite platform. Seeing your five-star reviews is a huge encouragement to me. Not sure how to do it? You can go to compare to who.me slash podcast, scroll to the bottom, and you'll find all the information. And while you're at compare to who.me, check out some of the more than 500 articles on there about body image, comparison, all the things you're thinking about. Plus, you can find out more about my books, or you can grab a time for a free 10 minute call to see if coaching is right for you. I'm so honored to be a part of your journey out of body image and comparison frustration. And I can't wait to hear how God is working to set you free.